When a new technology is introduced, there's often a whole new system that goes along with it. Take automotive technology, for instance. The invention of the car meant that there was a need, among other things, for gas stations, new roads, train mechanics, and manufacturing plants to make the cars. And for a complex invention like the car to be successful, it needed to be readily available and affordable. Henry Ford was the man who made that happen. He assembled a team of some of the finest automotive engineers in Detroit with the goal of designing an inexpensive, reliable car. They started by simplifying the technology. Other cars at the time needed more than 8,000 parts. Ford's Model T had just 5,000. And the Model T was a work of art. It was rugged, it handled well, and it was easy to maintain. It's a perfect match for uh, the situation in 1908, 1909, 1910. It hit it, 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 not often I think that a design hits its environment perfectly, just boom, without any overlap and slippage, and this one did. Ford couldn't keep up with the demand for the Model T. In 1912, the Highland Park plant manufactured 78,000 cars, twice as many as the year before, and the order still flooded in. We're now talking a volume of production that no one has ever thought of in history. So if you're going to really turn out thousands and thousands of units, you've got to now get very fine-grained about how do you get these heavy, funny-shaped objects, the various subcomponents of a car. How do you get them to where you want them when you want them? The Ford plant was laid out so that materials flowed through the plant in a logical sequence to build the cars. They also designed special purpose machine tools that required little skill to operate or could replace a worker altogether. But one problem still remained. Getting the parts to fit is the joker in the deck. The trick of cutting metal so that it's the right shape is handled by manufacturers most of the time until about 1905 with files and vices at the end. So you have a skilled person who says, no, not quite right, put it in the vise, well, that's better, put it back on, try it, make sure. So it's called hand fitting and finishing. It takes a revolution in the strength of cutting tools so that you've got knives to cut metal, and the knives have to be strong enough that they don't keep wearing out. And then you can begin to say, all right, here's a box full of these things. No one has to finish these off. Just grab any one out of the box, and it'll fit right on there the way it has to. Once you begin to have genuine interchangeable parts, then the concept of flow changes. On April 1st, 1913, Ford introduced assembly line production. Workers were instructed to add one part to an assembly pass it to the next worker, and then repeat the same action. After some adjustments, productivity increased fourfold. There were assembly lines for engines and other assembly lines for transmissions. Soon, workers were producing the parts faster than the chassis could be assembled. So Ford experimented with a moving line for chassis assembly as well. At first, workers moved along with the line. Then they took fixed positions and the parts were delivered to them. The assembly line reduced the time it took to assemble the chassis from 12 and a half hours to under two hours. Between 1913 and 1914, Ford nearly doubled the number of Model Ts it was able to produce. And assembly line technology became industry standard.